Hi, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. Hopefully I'm going to log in right now. Hopefully everything is going good because last time it didn't. It didn't go very well. Hi, Darcy. Oh, no. Is everybody okay? I hope everyone's okay, Darcy. It sounds better. I hope so. Hopefully Wi-Fi. I'm not getting the little Wi-Fi um, notice that I was getting before. So hopefully that means everything is okay. And I'm doing, so I was thinking, how am I going to read in the dark? But we'll try it. <laughs> I have no idea if it's going to work or not. Um, and how that will affect reading. But we'll see what happens and we'll give it a go. Hi, Eva. How are you doing? Everyone get cozy. So I have like a little light here. But, um, and let me know. <laughs> I'll check the comments every so often as much as I can. Let me know if I sound, because I listened back to the last time and it was so bad. Um, so I just deleted it straight away. You could smell smoke. Wait, the fire was at the school? That's so scary, Dark. So, yeah, so you have your son right now, though, right? So everything's, he's safe, you're safe. Hi, margaritas and palm trees. <laughs> you love the dark. I'm hoping I can read in the dark. <laughs> we'll see, right? So everyone just get cozy. Hopefully the sound will cooperate this time. Um, I'm going to start again with chapter eight. So this will be part two redone. And we'll see um, where it takes us. Okay. Yeah, it's like really hard to read. <laughs> okay, let's see. All right. My boss sends me home because of all the dried blood on my pants, and I'm overjoyed. The hole punched through my cheek doesn't ever heal. I'm going to work. And my punched out eye sockets are two swollen up black bagels around the little piss holes I have left to see through. Until today, it really pissed me off that I'd become this totally centered Zen master and nobody had noticed. Still, I'm doing little fact, the little facts thing. I write little haiku things and fax them around to everyone. When I pass people in the hall at work, I get totally zen right in everyone's hostile little face. Worker bees can leave. Even drones can fly away. The queen is their slave. You give up all your worldly possessions and your car and go live in a rented house in the toxic waste part of town where late at night, you can hear Marla and Tyler in his room calling each other human butt wipe. Take it, human butt wipe. Do it, butt wipe. Choke it down. Keep it down, baby. Just by contrast, this makes me the calm little center of the world. Me with my punched out eyes and dried blood in big black crusty stains on my pants. I'm saying, hello to everybody at work. Hello, look at me. Hello, I am so zen. This is blood. This is nothing. Hello, everything is nothing. And it's so cool to be enlightened, like me. Sigh. Look, outside the window, a bird. My boss asked if the blood was my blood. The bird flies downward. I'm writing a little haiku in my head. Without just one nest, 
A bird can call the world home. Life is your career. I'm counting on my fingers. Five, seven, five. The blood, is it mine? Yeah, I say, some of it. This is the wrong answer. Like, this is a big deal. I have two pair of black trousers, six white shirts, six pair of underwear, the bare minimum. I go to fight club. These things happen. Go home, my boss says. Get changed. I'm starting to wonder if Tyler and Marla are the same person. Except for their humping. Every night in Marla's room. Doing it, doing it, doing it. Tyler and Marla are never in the same room. I never see them together. Still, you never see me and Zsa Zsa Gabor together. And this doesn't mean we're the same person. Tyler just doesn't come out when Marla's around. So I can wash the pants. Tyler has to show me how to make soap. Tyler's upstairs and the kitchen is filled with the smell of cloves and burnt hair. Marla's at the kitchen table, burning the inside of her arm with a clove cigarette and calling herself human butt wipe. I embrace my own festering disease corruption, Marla tells, the cherry on the end of her cigarette. Marla twists the cigarette into the soft white belly of her arm. Burn, witch. Burn. Tyler's upstairs in my bedroom, looking at the teeth in my mirror, and says he got me a job as a banquet waiter, part-time. Tyler Tyler says, at the Pressman Hotel, if you can work in the evening, the job will stoke your class hatred. Yeah, I say, whatever. They make you wear a little black bow tie, Tyler says. All you need to work there is a white shirt and black trousers. Soap, Tyler, I say. We need soap. We need to make some soap. I need to wash my pants. I hold Tyler's feet while he does 200 sit-ups. To make soap, first we have to render fat. Tyler is full of useful information. Except for their humping, Marla and Tyler are never in the same room. If Tyler's around, Marla ignores him. This is familiar ground. This is exactly how my parents were invisible to each other. Then my father went off to start another franchise. My father always said, get married before the sex gets boring or you'll never get married. My mother said, never buy anything with a nylon zipper. My parents never said anything you'd want to embroider on a cushion. Tyler does 198 sit-ups, 199, 200. Tyler is wearing a sort of gummy flannel bathrobe and sweatpants. Get Marla out of the house, Tyler says. Send Marla to the store for a can of lye, the flake kind of lye, not the crystal kind. Just get rid of her. Me, I'm six years old again and making and taking messages back and forth between my estranged parents. I hated this when I was six. I hate it now. Tyler, I might have to just pause for a second. Sorry, guys. Sorry, everybody. I hope this sounds okay. Okay. Um, So me, I'm six years old again and taking messages back and forth between my estranged parents. I hated this when I was six. I hate it now. 
Tyler starts doing leg lifts and I go downstairs to tell Marla the flake kind of lie and I give her a $10 bill and my bus pass. While Marla is still sitting in the kitchen table, I take the clove cigarette from between her fingers. Nice and easy. With a dishcloth, I wipe the rusty spots on Marla's arm where the burn scabs cracked and started to bleed. Then I wedge each of her feet into our high-heeled shoe. Marla looks down at me doing my Prince Charming routine with her shoes and she says, I let myself in. I didn't think anyone was home. Your front door doesn't lock. I don't say anything. You know, the condom is the glass slipper of our generation. You slip it on when you meet a stranger. You dance all night. Then you throw it away. The condom, I mean, not the stranger. I'm not talking to Marla. She can horn in on the support groups and Tyler, but there's no way she could be my friend. I've been waiting here all morning for you. Flowers bloom and die. Wind brings butterflies or snow. A stone won't notice. Marla gets up from the kitchen table and she's wearing a sleeveless blue colored dress made, some, made of some shiny material. Marla pinches the edge of her skirt and turns it up for me to see little dots of stitching on the inside. She's not wearing any underwear and she winks. I wanted to show you my new dress, Marla says. It's a bridesmaid dress and it's all hand sewn. Do you like it? The Goodwill thrift sold it for one dollar. Somebody did all these tiny stitches just to make this ugly, ugly dress, Marla says. Can you believe it? The skirt is longer on one side than on the other and the waist of the dress orbits low around Marla's hips. Before she leaves for the store, Marla lifts her skirt with her fingertips and sort of dances around me in the kitchen table, her ass flying around inside her skirt. What Marla loves, she says, is all the things that people love instant, in, intensely and then dump an hour or a day after. The way a Christmas tree is the center of attention. Then, after Christmas, you see those dead Christmas trees with the tinsel still on them, dumped alongside the highway. You see those trees and think of roadkill animals or sex crime victims wearing their underwear inside out and bound with black electrical tape. I just want her out of here. The animal control place is the best place to go, Marla says. When all the animals, the little doggies and kitties that people loved and then dumped, even the old animals dance and jump around for your attention because after three days, they get an overdose shot of sodium phenobarbital and then into the big pet oven. The big sleep, valley of dog style, where even if someone loves you enough to save your life, they still castrate you. Marla looks at me as if I'm the one humping her and says, I can't win with you, can I? Marla goes out the back door singing that creepy Valley of the Doll song. I just stare at her going. There's one, two, three moments of silence until all of Marla is gone from the room. I turn around and Tyler's appeared. Tyler says, did you get rid of her? Not a sound, not a smell. Tyler's just appeared. First, Tyler says and jumps from the kitchen doorway to digging in the freezer. First, we need to render some fat. About my boss, Tyler tells me, if I'm really angry, I should go to the post office and fill out a change of address card and have all his mail forwarded to Rugby, North Dakota. 
Tyler starts pulling out sandwich bags of frozen white stuff and dropping them in the sink. Me? I'm supposed to put a big pan on the stove and fill it most of the way with water. Too little water, and the fat will darken as it separates into tallow. This fat, Tyler says. It has a lot of salt, so the more water, the better. Put the fat in the water and get the water boiling. Tyler squeezes the white mess from each sandwich bag into the water, and then Tyler buries the empty bags all the way at the bottom of the trash. Tyler says, use a little imagination. Remember all that pioneer shit they taught you in Boy Scouts? Remember your high school chemistry. It's hard to imagine Tyler and Boy Scouts. Another thing I can do, Tyler tells me, is I could drive to my boss's house some night and hook a hose up to an outdoor spigot. Hook the hose to a hand pump and I could inject the house plumbing with a charge of industrial dye red or blue or green and wait to see how my boss looks the next day. Or I could just sit in the bushes and pump the hand pump until the plumbing was super pressurized to 110 PSI. This way, when someone goes to flush a toilet, the toilet tank will explode. At 150 PSI, if someone turns on the shower, the water pressure will blow off the shower head, strip the threads, blam, the shower head turns into a mortar shell. Tyler only says this to make me feel better. The truth is, I like my boss. Besides, I'm enlightened now. You know, only Buddha style behavior, spider chrysanthemums, the Diamond Sutra and the Blue Cliff Record. Hari Rama, you know, Krishna Krishna. You know, enlightened. Sticking, sticking feathers up your butt, Tyler says, does not make you a chicken. As the fat renders, the tallow will float to the surface of the boiling water. Oh, I say, so I'm sticking feathers up my butt. As if Tyler, where the cigarette burns marching up his arms, is such an evolved soul. Mr. and Mrs. Human Butt Wipe. I calm my face down and turn into one of those Hindu cow people going to slaughter on the airline emergency procedure card. Turn down the heat under the pan. I stir the boiling water. More and more tallow will rise until the water is skinned over with a rainbow mother of pearl layer. Use a big spoon to skim the layer off and set the layer aside. So I say, how is Marla? Tyler says, at least Marla is trying to hit bottom. I stir the boiling water. Keep skimming until no more tallow rises. This is tallow we're skimming off the water. Good, clean tallow. Tyler says, I'm nowhere near hitting the bottom yet. And if I don't fall all the way, I can't be saved. Jesus did it with his crucifixion thing. I shouldn't just abandon money and property and knowledge. This is isn't just a weekend retreat. I should run from self-improvement and I should be running toward disaster. I can't just play it safe anymore. This isn't a seminar. If you lose your nerve before you hit the bottom, Tyler says, you'll never really succeed. Only after disaster can we be resurrected. It's only after you've lost everything, Tyler says, that you're free to do anything. What I'm feeling is premature enlightenment. And keep stirring, Tyler says. When the fat's boiled enough that no more tallow rises, throw out the boiling water, wash the pot, and fill it with clean water. I ask, am I anywhere near hitting the bottom? 
Where you're at now, Tyler says, you can't even imagine what bottom will be like. Repeat the process with the skimmed tallow. Boil the tallow in the water. Skim and keep skimming. The fat we're using has a lot of salt in it, Tyler says. Too much salt and your soap won't get solid. Boil and skim. Boil and skim. Marla's back. The second Marla opens the screen door, Tyler is gone. Vanished. Run out of the room. Disappeared. Tyler's gone upstairs, or Tyler's gone down to the basement. Poof. Marla comes in the back door with a canister of live flakes. At the store, they have 100% recycled toilet paper, Marla says. The worst job in the whole world must be recycling toilet paper. I take the canister of lye and put it on the table. I don't say anything. Can I stay overnight tonight? Marla says. I don't answer. I count in my head. Five syllables, seven, five. A tiger can smile. A snake will say it loves you. Lies make us evil. Marla says, what are you cooking? I'm Joe's boiling point. I say, go, just go. Just get out. Okay, don't you have a big enough chunk of my life yet? Marla grabs my sleeve and holds me in one place for a second it takes to kiss my cheek. Please call me, she says. Please, we need to talk. I say, yeah, 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 yeah. The moment Marla is out the door, Tyler appears back in the room. Fast as a magic trick. My parents did this magic act for five years. I boil and skim while Tyler makes room in the fridge. Steam layers of air and water drips from the kitchen ceiling. The 40 watt bulb hidden in the back of the fridge. Something bright I can't see behind the empty ketchup bottles and jars of pickle brine or mayonnaise. Some tiny light from inside the fridge edges Tyler's profile bright. Boil and skim, boil and skim. Put the skim tallow into milk cartons with the tops opened all the way. With a chair pulled up to the open fridge, Tyler watches the tallow cool. In the heat of the kitchen, clouds of cold fog waterfall out from the bottom of the fridge and pool around Tyler's feet. As I fill the milk cartons with tallow, Tyler puts them in the fridge. I go to kneel beside Tyler in front of the fridge and Tyler takes my hands and shows them to me. The lifeline, the love line, the mounds of Venus and Mars, the cold fog pooling around us, the dim, bright light on our faces. In my back, I think I cut out for a minute. I'm not sure. I need you to do me another favor, Tyler says. This is about Marla, isn't it? Don't ever talk to her about me. Don't talk about me behind my back. Do you promise? Tyler says. Thank you, Darcy. I promise. Tyler says, if you ever mention me to her, you'll never see me again. I promise. Promise. I promise. Tyler says. Now remember, that was three times that you promised. A layer of something thick and clear is collecting on top of the tallow in the fridge. The tallow, I say, it's separating. Don't worry, Tyler says. The clear layer is glycerin. You can mix the glycerin back in when you make soap. Or you can skim the glycerin off. 
Tyler licks his lips and turns my hands palm down on his thighs on the gummy flannel lap of his bathrobe. You can mix the glycerin with nitric acid to make nitroglycerin, Tyler says. I breathe with my mouth open and say, nitroglycerin. Tyler licks his lips wet and shining and kisses the back of my hand. You can mix the nitroglycerin with sodium nitrate and sawdust to make dynamite, Tyler says. The kiss shines wet on the back of my white hand. Dynamite, I say, and I sit back on my heels. Tyler pries the lid off the can of lie. You can blow up bridges, Tyler says. You can mix the nitroglycerin with more nitric acid and paraffin and make gelatin explosives, Tyler says. You could blow up a building easy, Tyler says. Tyler tilts the can of lye an inch above the shining wet kiss on the back of my hand. This is a chemical burn, Tyler says, and it will hurt worse than you've ever been burned worse than a hundred cigarettes the kiss shines on the back of my hand you'll have a scar tyler says with enough soap tyler says you can blow up the whole world now remember your promise and tyler pours the lie chapter nine Tyler's saliva did two jobs. The wet kiss on the back of my hand held the flakes of lye when they burned. That was the first job. The second was lye only burns when you combine it with water or saliva. This is a chemical burn, Tyler says, and it will hurt more than you've ever been burned. You can use lye to open clogged drains, close your eyes. A paste of lye and water can burn through an aluminum pan. A solution of lye and water will dissolve a wooden spoon. Combined with water, lye heats to over 200 degrees. And as it heats, it burns into the back of my hand and Tyler places his fingers in one hand over my fingers. Our hands spread on the lap of my blood-stained pants. And Tyler says to pay attention because this is the greatest moment of my life. Because everything up to now is a story, Tyler says. And everything after now is a story. This is the greatest moment of our life. The lie clinging in the exact shape of Tyler's kiss is a bonfire or a branding iron or an atomic pile meltdown on my hand at the end of a long, long road I picture miles away from me. Tyler tells me to come back and be with him. My hand is leaving, tiny and on the horizon at the end of the road. Picture the fire still burning except now it's beyond the horizon, a sunset. Come back to the pain, Tyler says. This is the kind of guided meditation they use at support groups. Don't even think of the word pain. Guided meditation works for cancer. It can work for this. Look at your hand, Tyler says. Don't look at your hand. Don't think of the word searing or flesh or tissue or charred. Don't hear yourself cry. Guided meditation. You're in Ireland. Close your eyes. You're in Ireland the summer after you left college and you're drinking at a pub near the castle where every day busloads of English and American tourists come to kiss the bar, the bar, the bar knee stone. Don't shut this out, Tyler says. Soap and human sacrifice go hand in hand. 
You leave the pub in a stream of men, walking through the beaded wet car silence of streets where it's just rained. It's night. Until you get to the Bal Barney Stone Castle. The floors in the castle are rotted away and you climb the rock stairs with blackness getting deeper and deeper on every side with every step up. Everybody is quiet with the climb and the tradition of this little act of rebellion. <laughs> Listen to me, Tyler says. Open your eyes. In ancient history, Tyler says, human sacrifices were made on a hill above a river. Thousands of people, listen to me. The sacrifices were made and the bodies were burned on a pyre. You can cry, Tyler says. You can go to the sink and run water over your hand. But first, you have to know that you're stupid and you will die. Look at me. Someday, Tyler says, you will die. And until you know that, you're useless to me. You're in Ireland. You can cry, Tyler says. But every tear that lands in the lye flakes on your skin will burn a cigarette burn scar. Guided meditation. You're in Ireland the summer after you left college, and maybe this is where you first wanted anarchy. Years before you met Tyler Durden, before you pet before you peed in your first creme aglanese. You learned about little acts of rebellion in Ireland. You're standing on a platform at the top of the stairs in a castle. We can use vinegar, Tyler says, to neutralize the burning. But first, you have to give up. After hundreds of people were sacrificed and burned, Tyler says, a thick white discharge crept from the altar downhill to the river. First, you have to hit bottom. You're on a platform in a castle in Ireland with bottomless darkness all around the edge of the platform and ahead of you, across an arm's length of darkness is a rock wall. Rain, Tyler says, fell on the burnt pyre year after year. And year after year, people were burned, and the rain seeped through the wood ashes to become a solution of lye, and the lye combined with the melted fat of the sacrifices, and a thick white discharge of soap crept out from the base of the altar and crept downhill toward the river. And the Irish men around you, with their little act of rebellion in the darkness, they walk to the edge of the platform and stand at the edge of the bottomless darkness and piss. And the men say, go ahead, piss your fancy. American piss rich and yellow with too many vitamins, rich and expensive and thrown away. This is the greatest moment of your life. Tyler says, and you're off somewhere missing it. You're in Ireland. Oh, and you're doing it. Oh, yeah. Yes. You can smell the ammonia and the daily allowance of B vitamins. Where the soap fell into the river, Tyler says, after a thousand years of killing people in rain, the ancient people found their clothes got cleaner if they washed at that spot. I'm pissing on the Barley Root Stone. Jeez, Tyler says. I'm pissing in my black trousers with the dried blood stains my boss can't stomach. You're in a rented house on Paper Street. 
This means something, Tyler says. This is a sign, Tyler says. Tyler is full of useful information. Cultures without soap, Tyler says. They used to ur- they use their urine and the urine of their dogs to wash their clothes and hair because of the uric acid and ammonia. There is the smell of vinegar and the fire on your hand at the end of a long road goes out. There's a smell of lye scaling and branch shape of your sinuses and the hospital vomit smell of piss and vinegar. It was right to kill all those people, Tyler says. The back of your hand is swollen red and glossy as a pair of lips in the exact shape of Tyler's kiss. Scattered around the kiss are the cigarette burn spots of somebody crying. Open your eyes, Tyler says, and his face is shining with tears. Congratulations, Tyler says. You're a step closer to hitting bottom. You have to see, he says, how the first soap was made of heroes. Think about the animals used in product testing. Think about the monkey shot into space. Without their death, their pain, without their sacrifice, Tyler says, we would have nothing. Chapter 10. I stop the elevator between floors while Tyler undoes his belt. When the elevator stops, the soup bowls stacked on the buffet cart stop rattling and steam mushrooms up the elevator ceiling as Tyler takes the lid off the soup tureen. Tyler starts to take himself out and says, don't look at me or I can't go. The soup's a sweet tomato bisque with cilantro and clams. Between the two, nobody will smell anything else we put in. I say, hurry up. And I look back over my shoulder at Tyler with his last half inch hanging in the soup. This looks in a really funny way, like a tall elephant in a waiter's white shirt and bow tie drinking soup through its little trunk. Tyler says, I said, don't look. The elevator door in front of me has a little face sized window that lets me look out into the banquet service corridor. With the elevator stop between floors, my view is about a cockroach above the green linoleum. And from here at cockroach level, the green corridor stretches toward the vanishing point, past half-open doors, where titans and their gigantic wives drink barrels of champagne and bellow at each other wearing diamonds bigger than I feel. Last week, I tell Tyler, when the Empire State lawyers were here from their Christmas party, I got mine hard and stuck it in all their orange mousses. Last week, Tyler says, he stopped the elevator and farted on a whole cart of Bocconi Dolce for the Junior League tea. That Tyler knows how a meringue will absorb odor. At cockroach level, we can hear the captive harpist make music as the titans lift forks of of butterflied lamb chops, each bite the size of a whole pig, each mound a tearing stone edge of ivory. I say, go already, Tyler says. I can't. If the soup gets cold, they'll send it back. The giants, they'll send something back to the kitchen for no reason at all. They just want to see you run around for their money. At dinner like this, these banquet parties, they know the tip is already included in the bill, so they treat you like dirt. We don't really take anything back to the kitchen. Move the pumps, Parasini. 
and the asparagus hollandaise around the plate a little, serve it to someone else, and all of a sudden it's fine. I say, Niagara Falls, the Nile River. In school, we all thought if you put somebody's hand in a bowl of warm water while they slept, they'd wet the bed. Tyler says, uh, behind me, Tyler says, oh, yeah, oh, I'm doing it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Past half open doors in the ballrooms, off the service corridor, swish gold and black and red skirts as tall as the gold velvet curtains at old Broadway theater. Now and again, there are pairs of Cadillac sedans in black leather with shoelaces where the windshields should be. Above the cars move a city of office towers in red cummerbunds. cummerbunds. Not too much, I say. Tyler and me, we've turned into the guerrilla terrorists of the service industry. Dinner party sabotars. The hotel cater dinner parties, and when somebody wants the food, they get the food, and the wine, and the china, and glassware, and the waiters. They get all the works, all on one bill. And because they know they can't threaten you with a tip, to them, you're just a cockroach. Tyler, he did a dinner party one time. This was when Tyler turned into a renegade waiter. That first dinner party, Tyler was serving the fish course in this white and glass cloud of a house that seemed to float over the city on steel legs attached to a hillside. Part of, it, part of the way through the fish course, while Tyler's rinsing plates from the pasta course, the hostess comes into the kitchen holding a scrap of paper that flaps like a flag. Her hand is shaking that much. Through her clenched teeth, Madame wants to know, did the waiter see any of the guests go down the hallway that leads to the bedroom part of the house, especially any of the women guests or the host? In the kitchen, it's Tyler and Albert and Len and Jerry rinsing the stacks of plates and the prep cook, Leslie, basting garlic butter on the artichoke heart stuffed with shrimp and escargot. We're not supposed to go to that part of the house, Tyler says. We come in through the garage. All we're supposed to see is the garage, the kitchen, and the dining room. The host comes in behind his wife in the kitchen doorway and takes the scrap of paper out of her shaking hand. This will be all right, he says. How can I face those people, Madame says, unless I know who did this? The host puts a flat open hand against the back of her silky white party dress that matches her house and Madame straightens up, her shoulders squared and all of a sudden, everything's quiet. They're your guests, he says, and this party is very important. This looks in a really funny way, like a ventriloquist bringing his dummy to life. Madame looks at her husband, and with a little shove, the host takes his wife back into the dining room. The note drops to the floor, and the two-way swish, swish, of the kitchen door sweeps the note against Tyler's feet. Albert says, what's it say? Len goes out to start cleaning the fish course. Leslie slides the tray of artichoke hearts back into the oven and says, what does it say already? Tyler looks right at Leslie and says, without even picking up the note, I have passed an amount of urine into at least one of your many elegant fragrances. Albert smiles. You pissed in her perfume? No, Tyler says. He just left the note stuck between the bottles. She's got about a hundred bottles sitting on a mirror counter in her bathroom. Leslie smiles. So you didn't really? No, Tyler says. But she doesn't know that. The whole rest of the night in that white and glass dinner party in the sky, Tyler kept clearing plates of cold artichoke and cold veal with cold pomace 
Duchenes and cold chauffeur a la polonaise from in front of the hostess and Tyler kept filling her wine glass about a dozen times. Madame sat watching each of her women guests eat the food until between clearing the sorbet dishes and serving the apricot gat new, Madame's place at the head of the table was all of a sudden empty. They were washing up after the guests had left, loading the coolers and the china back into the hotel van. When the host came in the kitchen and asked, would Albert please come help him with something? Leslie says, maybe Tyler went too far. Loud and fast, Tyler sees how they kill whales. Tyler says, to make that perfume, that costs more than gold per ounce. Most people have never seen a whale. Leslie has two kids in an apartment next to the freeway, and Madame Host has more bucks than we'll make in a year and bottles on her bathroom counter. Albert comes back from helping the host and dials 911 on the phone. Albert puts a hand over the mouth part and says, Man, Tyler shouldn't have left that note. Tyler says, So tell the banquet manager, get me fired. I'm not married to this chicken shit job. Everybody looks at their feet. Getting fired, Tyler says, is the best thing that could happen to any of us. That way, we quit treading water and do something with our lives. Albert says into the phone that we need an ambulance and the address. Waiting on the line, Albert says the hostess is a real mess right now. Albert had to pick her up from next to the toilet. The host couldn't pick her up because Madame says he's the one who peed in He's the one who peed in the perfume bottles, and she says he's trying to drive her crazy by having an affair with one of those women guests tonight. And she's tired, tired of all the people they call their friends. The host can't pick her up because Madame's fallen down between the toilet in her white dress, and she's waving around half a broken perfume bottle. Madame says she'll cut his throat if he even tries to touch her. Tyler says, cool. And Albert stinks. Leslie says, Albert, honey, you stink. There's no way you could come out of that bathroom not stinking. Albert says, every bottle of perfume is broken on the floor and the toilet is piled full of all the other bottles. They look like ice, Albert says, like at the fanciest hotel parties where we have to fill the urinals with crushed ice. The bathroom stinks and the floor is gritty with, with slivers of ice that just won't melt. And when Albert helps Madame to her feet, her white dress wet with yellow stains, Madame swings the broken bottle at the host, slips in the perfume and broken glass and lands on her palms. She's crying and bleeding, curled against the toilet. Oh, and it stings, she says. Oh, Walter, it stings. It's stinging, Madame says. The perfume, all those dead whales in the cuts of her hands, it stings. The host pulls Madame to her feet against him. Madame holding her hands up as if she were praying, but with her hands an inch apart and blood running down the palms, down the wrist, across a diamond bracelet, and to her elbows where it drips. And the host, he says, it will be all right, Nina. My hands, Walter, Madame says, it will be all right. Madame says, who would do this to me? Who would hate me this much? The host says to Albert, would you call an ambulance? This was Tyler's first mission as a service industry terrorist. Gorilla waiter, minimum wage despoiler. Tyler's been doing this for years, but he says everything is more fun as a shared activity. At the end of Albert's story, Tyler smiles and says, cool. 
back in the hotel right now and the elevator stopped between the kitchen and the banquet floors. I tell Tyler how I sneezed on the trout in the aspect for the dermato for the dermatolog for the dermatological convention. And three people told me it was too salty, and one person said it was delicious. Tyler shakes himself off over the soup tureen and says he's run dry. This is easier with cold soup or when the chefs make a really fresh gazpacho. This is impossible with an onion soup that has a crust of melted cheese on it. If I ever ate here, that's what I'd order. We were running out of ideas, Tyler and me. Doing stuff to the food got to be boring. Almost part of the job description. Then I hear one of the doctors, lawyers, whatever, say how a hepatitis bug can live on stainless steel for six months. You have to wonder how long this bug can live on rum custard charlotte roots or salmon tibble, timbell. I asked the doctor where we could get our hands on some of these hepatitis bugs and if he's drunk enough to laugh. Everyone goes to the medical waste dump, he says, and he laughs. Everything. The medical waste dump sounds like hitting bottom. On one hand, the elevator, one hand on the elevator control, I ask Tyler if he's ready. The scar is on the back of my hand, and it's swollen red and glossy as a pair of lips in the exact shape of Tyler's kiss. One second, Tyler says. The tomato soup must still be hot because the crooked thing Tyler tucks in his pants is boiled pink as a jumbo prawn. Chapter 11. In South America, land of enchantment, we could be wading in, wading in river where tiny fish will swim up to Tyler's urethra. The fish have barbed spines that flare out and back. So once they're up Tyler, the fish set up housekeeping and get ready to lay their eggs. In so many ways, how we spent Saturday night could be worse. It could have been worse, Tyler says. What we did with Marla's mother, I say, shut up. Tyler says, the French government could have taken us to an underground complex outside of Paris. We're not even surgeons, but semi-skilled technicians would razor our eyelids off as part of toxicity training and aerosol tanning spray. This stuff happens, Tyler says. Read the newspaper. What's worse is I knew what Tyler had been up to with Marla's mother. But for the first time since I've known him, Tyler had some real play money. Tyler was making real bucks. Nordstrom's called and left an order for 200 bars of Tyler's brown sugar facial soap before Christmas. At 20 bucks a bar, suggested retail price, we had money to go out on Saturday night. Money to fix the leak in the gas line, go dancing. Without money to worry about, maybe I could quit my job. Tyler calls himself the Paper Street Soap Company. People are saying it's the best soap ever. What would have been worse, Tyler says is if you had accidentally eaten Marla's mother. Through a mouthful of Kung Pao chicken, I say to just shut the hell up. Where we are this Saturday night is the front seat of a 1968 Impala, sitting on two flats in the front row of a used car lot. Tyler and me were talking drinking beer out of cans, and the front seat of this Impala is bigger than most people's sofas. The car lots up and down this part of town, this part of the boulevard in the industry, they call these lots the pot lots, where cars all cost $200, and during the day, the gypsy guys who run these lots stand around in their plywood offices smoking long, 
thin cigars. The cars are the beater first kids' cars drive in high school. Gremlins and Pacers, Mavericks and Hornets, Pintos, International Harvester pickup trucks, lowered Camaros and Dusters and Impalas. Cars that people loved and then dumped. Animals at the pound, bridesmaid dresses at the Goodwill, with dent and gray or red or black primer quarter panels and rocker panels and lumps of body putty that nobody ever got around to sanding. Plastic wood and plastic leather and plastic chrome interiors. At night, the gypsy guys don't even lock the car doors. The headlights on the boulevard go by behind the price painted on the Impala's big Wrap around cinema scrope windshield. See the USA. The price is in $98. From the inside, this, this looks like 89 cents. Zero, zero, decimal point, eight, nine. America is asking you to call. Most of the cars here are about $100. And all the cars have an as is sales agreement hanging in the driver's window. We choose the Impala because if we have to sleep in a car on Saturday night, this car has the biggest seats. We're eating Chinese because we can't go home. It was either sleep here or stay up all night at an after hours dance club. We didn't go to dance clubs. Tyler says the music is so loud especially the bass tracks, that it screws with his biorhythm. The last time we went out, Tyler said the loud music made him constipated. This and the club is too loud to talk. So after a couple of drinks, everyone feels like the center of attention, but completely cut off from participating with anybody else. You're the corpse in an English murder mystery. We're sleeping in a car tonight because Marla came to the house and threatened to call the police and have me arrested for cooking her mother. And then Marla slammed around the house, screaming that I was a ghoul and a cannibal. And she was kicking through the piles of Reader's Digest and National Geographic. And then I left her there in a nutshell. After her accidental, on-purpose suicide with Xanax at the Regent Hotel, I can't imagine Marla calling the police, but Tyler thought it would be good to sleep out tonight, just in case. Just in case Marla burns the house down. Just in case Marla goes out and finds a gun. Just in case Marla is still in the house. Just in case. I try to get centered. <sighs> Watching white moon face, the stars never feel anger. Blah, blah, blah. The end. Here, with the cars going by on the boulevard and a beer in my hand in the Impala with its cold, hard, bake light steering wheel, maybe three feet in diameter and the cracked vinyl seat pinching my ass through my jeans, Tyler says, one more time, tell me exactly what happened. For weeks, I ignored what Tyler had been up to. One time, I went with Tyler to the Western Union office and watched as he sent Marla's mother a telegram. Hideously wrinkled, stop. Please help me. End. Tyler had showed the clerk Marla's library card and signed Marla's name to the telegram order and yelled, yes, Marla can be a guy's name sometimes. And the clerk could just mind his own business. When we were leaving the Western Union, Tyler said, if I loved him, I'd trust him. This wasn't something I needed to know about. Tyler told me, and he took me to Garza Garbanzo's for hummus. 
what really scared me wasn't the telegram as much as it was eating out with Tyler. Never, no, never had Tyler ever paid cash for anything. For clothes, Tyler goes to gyms and hotels and claims clothing out of the lost and found. This is better than Marla, who goes to laundromats to steal jeans out of the dryers and sell them at $12 a pair to those places that buy used jeans. Tyler never ate in restaurants, and Marla never, and Marla wasn't wrinkled. For no apparent reason, Tyler sent Marla's mother a 15 pound box of chocolates. <laughs> Another way this Saturday night could be worse, Tyler tells me in the Impala, is the brown recluse spider. When it bites you, it injects not just a venom, but a digestive enzyme or acid that dissolves the tissue around the bite, literally melting your arm or your leg or your face. Tyler was hiding out tonight when all this started. Marla showed up at the house without even knocking. Marla leans inside the front door and shouts, knock, knock. I'm reading Reader's Digest in the kitchen. I am totally non-phased. Marla yells, Tyler, can I come in? Are you home? I yell, Tyler's not home. Marla yells, don't be mean. By now, I'm at the front door. Marla standing in the foyer with a Federal Express overnight package and says, I need to put something in your freezer. I dog at her heels on the way to the kitchen saying, no, 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 no. She is not going to start keeping her junk in this house. But pumpkin, Marla says, I don't have a freezer at the hotel. And you said I could. No, I did not. The last thing I want is Marla moving in one piece of crap at a time. Marla has her Federal Express package ripped open on the kitchen table and she lifts something white out of the styrofoam packaging peanuts and shakes this white thing in my face. This is not crap, she says. This is my mother you're talking about, so fuck off. What Marla lifts out of the package, it's one of those sandwich bags of white stuff that Tyler rendered for tallow to make soap. Things would have been worse, Tyler says, if you'd accidentally eaten what was in one of those sandwich bags. If you'd got up in the middle of the night sometime and squeezed out the white goo and added California onion soup mix and eaten it as dip with potato chips or broccoli. More than anything in the world right then, while Marla and I were standing in the kitchen, I didn't want Marla to open the freezer. I asked, what was she going to do with the white stuff? Paris lips, Marla said. As you get older, your lips pull inside your mouth. I'm saving for a collagen lip injection. I have almost 30 pounds of collagen in your freezer. I asked, how big a lips did she want? Marla said it was the operation itself that scared her. The stuff in the Federal Express package, I tell Tyler in the Impala, that was the same stuff we made soap out of. Ever since silicone turned out to be dangerous, collagen has become the hot item to have injected to smooth out wrinkles or to puff up thin lips or weak chins. The way Marla had explained it, most collagen you get cheap is from cow fat that's been sterilized and processed. But that kind of of cheap collagen doesn't last very long in your body. Wherever you get it injected, say in your lips, your body rejects it and starts to poop it out, 
Six months later, you have thin lips again. The best kind of collagen, Marla said, is your own fat, sucked out of your thighs, processed and clean, and injected back into your lips or wherever. This kind of collagen will last. The stuff in the fridge at home, it was Marla's collagen's trust fund. Whenever her mom grew any extra fat, she had it sucked out and packaged. Marla says the process is called gleaning. If Marla's mom doesn't need the collagen herself, she sends the packets to Marla. Marla never has any fat of her own, and her mom figures that familial collagen would be better than Marla ever having to use the cheap cow stuff. Streetlight along the boulevard comes through the sales agreement in the window and prints as is on Tyler's cheek. Spiders, Tyler says. Spiders could lay their eggs in larva, could tunnel under your skin. That's how bad your life could get. Right now, my almond chicken in its warm, creamy sauce tastes like something sucked out of Marla's mother's thighs. It was right then, standing in the kitchen with Marla, that I knew what Tyler had done. Hideously wrinkled. And I knew why he sent candy to Marla's mother. Please help. I say, Marla, you don't want to look in the freezer. Marla says, do what? We never eat red meat, Tyler tells me in the Impala. And he can't use chicken fat or the soap won't harden into, the, into a bar. The stuff, Tyler says, is making us a fortune. We paid the rent with that collagen. I say, you should have told Marla. Now she thinks I did it. Saponification, Tyler says, is the chemical reaction you need to make good soap. Chicken fat won't work or any fat with too much salt. Listen, Tyler says, we have a big order to fill. What we'll do is send Marla's mom some chocolates and probably some fruitcakes. I don't think that'll work well anymore. Long story short, Marla looked in the freezer. Okay, there was a little scuffle first. I try to stop her and the bag she's holding gets dropped and breaks open on the linoleum and we both slip in the greasy white mess and come up gagging. I have Marla around the waist from behind, her black hair whipping at my face, her arms pinned to her sides and I'm saying, over and over. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. My mother, you're spilling her all over. We needed to make soap, I say, with my face pressed up behind her ear. We needed to wash my pants, to pay the rent, to fix the leak in the gas line. It wasn't me. It was Tyler. Marla screams, what are you talking about? And twists out of her skirt. I'm scrambling to get up off the greased floor with an armful of Marla's Indian cotton print shirt. And Marla in her panties and, wedgy, and wedged heels and peasant blouse throws open the freezer part of the fridge. And inside, there's no collagen trust fund. There's two old flashlight batteries and that's all. Where is she? I'm already crawling backwards on my hands, slipping, my shoes slipping on the linoleum, my ass wiping a clean path across the dirty floor away from Marla and the fridge. I hold up the skirt so I don't have to see Marla's face when I tell her the truth. We need soap out of it. Her, Marla's mother, soap, soap, you boil fat, 
you mix it with lye, you get soap. When Marla screams, I throw the skirt in her face and run. I slip. I run. Around and around the first floor, Marla runs after me, skidding on the corners, pushing off against the window casings for moment for momentum, slipping leaving the filthy handprints of grease and floor dirt among the wallpaper flowers, falling and sliding into the wainscoting, getting back up, running. Marla's screaming, You boiled my mother? Tyler boiled her mother. Marla's screaming, always one swipe of her fingernails behind me. Tyler boiled her mother. You boiled my mother. The front door was still open. And then I was out the front door with Marla screaming in a doorway behind me. My feet didn't slip against the concrete sidewalk and I just kept running until I found Tyler or until Tyler found me and I told him what happened. With one beer each, Tyler and I spread out on the front and back seats with me in the front seat. Even now, Marla's probably still in the house, throwing magazines against the walls and screaming how I'm a prick and a monster, two-faced, capitalistic, suck-ass bastard. The miles of night between Marla and me offer insects and melanomas and flesh-eating viruses. Where I am at, isn't so bad. When a man is hit by lightning, Tyler says, his head burns down to a smoldering baseball and his zipper welds itself shut. I say, did we hit bottom tonight? Tyler lies back and asks, if Marilyn Monroe was alive right now, what would she be doing? I say, good night. The headliner hangs down in shards from the ceiling, and Tyler says, clawing at the lid of her coffin. Chapter 12. My boss stands too close to my desk with his little smile, his lips together and stretched thin, his crouch at my elbow, his, his crotch at my elbow. I look up from writing the cover letter for a recall campaign. These letters always begin the same way. This notice is sent to you in accordance with the requirements of the National Motor Vehicle Safety Act. We have determined that a def deficit exists. This week, I ran the liability formula, and for once, A times B times C equaled more than the cost of the recall. This week, it's a little plastic clip that holds the rubber blade on your windshield wipers, a throwaway item. Only 200 vehicles affected, next to nothing for the labor cost. Last week was more typical. Last week, the issue was some leather cured with some unknown substance, synthetic, near it, or something. Just as illegal, that's still used in third world tanning. Something so strong that it could cause birth defects in the fetus of any pregnant woman who comes across it. Last week, nobody called the Department of Transportation. Nobody initiated a recall. New leather multiplied by labor costs, multiplied by administration costs, would equal more than our first quarter profits. If anyone ever discovers our mistake, we can still pay off a lot of grieving families before we come close to the cost of retrofitting 6,500 leather interiors. But this week, we're doing a recall campaign. And this week, insomnia is back. Insomnia. And now the whole world figures to stop by and take a dump on my grave. My boss is wearing his gray tie, so today must be Tuesday.
My boss brings a sheet of paper to my desk and, ask, and asks if I'm looking for something. This paper was left in the copy machine, he says, and begins to read. The first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. His eyes go side to side across the paper and he giggles. The second rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. I hear Tyler's words come out of my boss, Mr. Boss, with his midlife spread and family photo on his desk and his dreams about early retirement and winter spent in a trailer park hookup in some Arizona desert. My boss with his extra stark shirts and standing appointments for haircuts every Tuesday after lunch. He looks at me and he says, I hope this isn't yours. I'm Joe's blood boiling rage. Tyler asked me to type up Fight Club rules and make him 10 copies, not nine, not 11. Tyler says 10. Still, I have the insomnia and can't remember sleeping since three nights ago. This must be a, the original I typed. I made 10 copies and forgot the original. The paparazzi flash of the copy machine in my face. The insomnia distance of everything. A copy of a copy of a copy. You can't touch anything and nothing can touch you. My boss reads, the third rule of Fight Club is two men per fight. Neither of us blinks. My boss reads, one fight at a time. I haven't slept in three days unless I'm sleeping now. My boss shakes the paper under my nose. What about it? He says. Is this some kind of little game I'm playing on company time? I'm paid for my full attention, not to waste time with a little war game. And I'm not paid to abuse the copy machines. What about it? She shakes the paper under my nose. What do I think? He asks. What should he do with an employee who spends company time in some little fantasy world? If I was in his shoes, what would I do? What would I do? The hole in my cheek, the blue-black swelling around my eyes, and the swollen red scar of Tyler's kiss on the back of my hand, a copy of a copy of a copy. Speculation. Why does Tyler want 10 copies of the Fight Club rules? Hindu cow. What would I do, I say, is uh, I'd be very careful who I talk to about this paper. I say, it sounds like some dangerous, psychotic killer wrote this, and this button-down schizophrenic could probably go over the edge at any moment in the working day and stalk from office to office with an Armlight AR-180 carbine gas operated semi-automatic. My boss just looks at me. The guy, I say, is probably at home every night with a little rat tail file, filing across into the tip of every one of his rounds. This way, when he shows up to work one morning and pumps around into his nagging, petty, whining, butt-sucking, candy-ass boss, that one round will split along the filed grooves and spread open the way a dum dum bullet flowers inside you to blow a bushel load of your stinking guts out through your spine. Picture your gut chakra opening in a slow motion explosion of sausage casing small intestine. My boss takes the paper out from under my nose. Go ahead, I say. Read some more. No, really, I say. It sounds fascinating. The work of a totally diseased mind. And I smile. A little butthole looking 
edges of the hole in my cheek are the same blue-black as a dog's gums. The skin stretched tight across the swelling around my eyes feels varnished. My boss just looks at me. Let me help you, I say. I say, the fourth rule of Fight Club is one fight at a time. My boss looks at the rules and then looks at me. I say, the fifth rule is no shoes, no shirts in the fight. My boss looks at the rules and looks at me. Maybe, I say, this totally diseased fuck would use an eagle apple Apache carbine because an Apache takes a 30 shot mag and only weighs nine pounds. The armor the armorite only takes a five round magazine with 30 shots. Our totally fucked hero could go the length of a mahogany row and take out every vice president with a cartridge left over for each director. Tyler's words coming out of my mouth. I used to be such a nice person. I just look at my boss. My boss has blue, blue, pale, cornflower blue eyes. The J and R68 semi-automatic carbine also takes a 30-shot mag, and it only weighs seven pounds. My boss just looks at me. It's scary, I say. This is probably somebody that's known for years. Probably this guy knows all about him, where he lives and where his wife works and his kids go to school. This is exhausting and all of a sudden, very, very boring. And why does Tyler need 10 copies of the Fight Club rules? When I don't have what I don't have to say is I know about the leather interiors that cause birth defects. I know about the counterfeit brake linings that looked good enough to pass the purchasing agent but fail after 2,000 miles. I know about the air conditioning rheostat that gets so hot it sets fire to the maps in your glove compartments. I know how many people burn alive because of the fuel injector flashback. I've seen people's legs cut off at the knee when turbochargers start exploding and I sent their their vent, their veins through the firewall and into the passenger compartment. I've been out in the field and seen the burned up cars and seen the reports where cause of failure is recorded as unknown. No, I say, the paper's not mine. I take the paper between two fingers and jerk it out of his hand. The edge must slice his thumb because his hand flies to his mouth and he's sucking hard. Eyes wide open. I crumble the paper into a ball and toss it in the trash can next to my desk. Maybe, I say, you shouldn't be bringing me every little piece of trash you pick up. Sunday night. I go to Remaining Men Together and the basement of Trinity Epicostal is almost empty. Just Big Bob and I dragging in with every muscle bruised inside and out, but my heart still racing and my thoughts are a tornado in my head. This is insomnia. All night, your thoughts are on the air. All night long, you're thinking, am I asleep? Have I slept? Insult to injury, Big Bob's arms come out of his t-shirt sleeves, quilted with muscle, and so hard they shine. Big Bob smiles. He's so happy to see me. He's thought I was dead. Yeah, I say, me too. Well, Big Bob says, I've got good news. Where is everybody? That's the good news, Big Bob says. The group's disbanded. I only came down here to tell any guys who might show up. I collapse with my eyes closed on one of the plaid thrift store couches. The good news, Big Bob says, is there's a new group. But the first rule about this new group is you aren't supposed to talk about it. 
Oh, Big Bob says. And the second rule is you're no, not supposed to talk about it. Oh, shit. I open my eyes. Fuck. The group's called Fight Club, Big Bob says. And it meets every Friday night in a closed garage across town. On Thursday nights, there's another fight club that meets at a garage closer by. I don't know either of these places. The first rule about Fight Club, Big Bob says, is you don't talk about a Fight Club. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday night, Tyler is in a movie pro is a movie projectionist. I saw his pay stub last week. The second rule about Fight Club, Big Bob says, is you don't talk about Fight Club. Saturday night, Tyler goes to Fight Club with me. Only two men per fight. Sunday morning, we came home beat up and sleep all afternoon. Only one fight at a time, Big Bob says. Sunday and Monday night, Tyler is waiting tables. You fight without shoes and clothes and shirts. Tuesday night, Tyler's at home making soap, wrapping it in tissue paper, shipping it out. The Paper Street Soap Company. The fights, Big Bob says, go on as long as they have to. Those are the rules invented by the guy who invented Fight Club. Big Bob asks, do you know him? I've never seen him myself, Big Bob says, but the guy's name is Tyler Durden. The Paper Street Soap Company. Do I know him? I don't know, I say. Maybe. Chapter 13. When I get up to the Regent Hotel, Marla is in the lobby wearing a bathrobe. Marla called me at work and asked, would I skip the gym and the library or the laundry or whatever I had planned after work and come see her instead? This is why Marla called, because she hates me. She doesn't say a thing about her college and trust fund. What Marla says is, would I do her a favor? Marla was lying in bed this afternoon. Marla lives on the meals that Meals on Wheels delivers for her neighbors who are dead. Marla accepts the meals and says they're sleeping. Long story short, this afternoon, Marla was just lying in bed waiting for the Meals on Wheels delivery between noon and two. Marla hasn't had health insurance for a couple of years, so she stopped looking. But this morning, she looks, and there seemed to be a lump on the nodes under her arms near the lump where hard and and the lump was hard and tender at the same time, and she couldn't tell anyone she loves because she doesn't want to scare them, and she can't afford to see a doctor if it's nothing. But she needed to talk to someone and someone to look at it. The color of Marla's brown eyes is like an animal that's been heated in a furnace and dropped into cold water. They call that vulcanized or galvanized or tempered. Marla says she'll forgive the collagen thing if I'll help her look. I figure she doesn't call Tyler because she doesn't want to scare him. I'm neutral in her book. I owe her. We go upstairs to her room and Marla tells me how the wild you don't see old, how in the wild you don't see old animals because as soon as they age, animals die. If they get sick or slow down, something stronger kills them. Animals aren't meant to grow old. Marla lies down on her bed and undoes the tie in her bathrobe and says, our culture has made death something wrong. Old animals should be an unnatural exception. Freaks. Marla's cold and sweating while I tell her how in college I had a wart once on my penis. Only I say dick. I went to the medical school to have it removed. The wart. Afterwards, I told my father. This was years after, and my dad laughed and told me I was a fool because warts like that are nature's French tickler. Women love them, and God was doing me a favor. 
kneeling next to Marla's bed with my hands still cold from outside, feeling Marla's cold skin a little at a time, rubbing a little of Marla's between my fingers every inch. Marla takes those warts that are God's French ticklers, give women cervical. Marla says those warts that are God's French ticklers give women cervical cancer. So I was sitting on the paper belt in the examining room at the medical school while a medical student sprays a canister of liquid, liquid nitrogen on my dick and eight medical students watched. This is where you end up if you don't have medical insurance. Only they don't call it a dick. They call it a penis and whatever you call it. Spray it with liquid nitrogen, and you might as well burn it with lye. It hurts so bad. Marla laughs. She laughs at this until she sees my fingers have stopped, like maybe I found something. Marla stops breathing, and her stomach goes like a drum, and her heart is like a fist pounding from inside the tight skin of a drum. But no, I stop because I'm talking, and I stop because... For a minute, neither of us was in Marla's bedroom. We were in the medical school years ago, sitting in the sticky paper with my dick on fire with liquid nitrogen, when one of the medical students saw my bare feet and left the room fast in two big steps. The student came back in behind three real doctors, and the doctors elbowed the man with a canister of liquid nitrogen to one side. The real doctor grabbed my bare right foot and heaved it in the face of the other real doctors. The three churned it and poked it and took Polaroid pictures of the foot. And it was as if the rest of the person half dressed with God's gift, half frozen, didn't exist. Only the foot and the rest of the medical students pressed in to see. How long, a doctor asked, have you had this red blotch on your foot? The doctor met my birthmark. On my right foot is a birthmark that my father jokes looks like a red, uh, like a dark red Australia with a little New Zealand right next to it. This is what I told them, and it let all the air out of everything. My dick was thawing out. Everyone except the student with the nitrogen left, and there was a sense that he would have left too. He was so disappointed he never met my eyes, and he took the head of my dick and stretched it toward himself. The canister jetted a tiny spray on what was left of the wart. The feeling? You could close your eyes and imagine your dick in a hun is a hundred miles long, and it would still hurt. Marla looks down at my hand and the scar from Tyler's kiss. I say to the medical student, you must not have seen a lot of birthmarks around here. It's not that. The student said everyone thought the birthmark was cancer. There was this new kind of cancer that was getting young men. They wake up with a red spot on their feet or ankles. The spots don't go away. They spread until they cover you and then you die. The student said the doctors and everyone were so excited because they thought you had this new cancer. Very few people had it, yet it was spreading. This was years and years ago. Cancer will be like that, I tell Marla. There will be mistakes, and maybe the point is not to forget the rest of yourself if one little part might go bad. Marla says, might. The student with the nitrogen finished up and told me the wart would drop off after a few days. On the sticky paper next to my bare ass was a Polaroid picture of my foot that, that no one wanted. I said, can I have the picture? I still have the picture in my room, stuck in the corner of a mirror in a frame. I comb my hair in the mirror before work every morning and think how I once had cancer for 10 minutes. Worse than cancer. I tell Marla that this Thanksgiving was the first year when my grandfather and I did not go ice skating, even though the ice was almost six inches thick. 
My grandmother always had these little round bandages on her forehead or her arms were moles she'd had her whole life didn't look right. They spread out with fringed edges or the moles churned from brown to blue or black. When my grandmother got out of the hospital the last time, my grandfather was carrying her suitcase and it was so heavy he complained that it felt lopsided. My French-Canadian grandmother was so modest that she never wore a swimming suit in public. And she always ran water in the sink to mask any sound she might make in the bathroom. Coming out of Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital, after a partial mastectomy, she says, You feel lopsided? For my grandfather, that sums up the whole story. My grandmother, cancer, their marriage, your life. He laughs every time he tells that story. Marla isn't laughing. I want to make her laugh, to warm her up, to make her forgive me for the collagen. I want to tell Marla there's nothing for me to find. If she found anything this morning, it was a mistake, a birthmark. Marla has a scar from Tyler's kiss on the back of her hand. I want to make Marla laugh so I don't tell her about the last time I hugged Chloe. Chloe without hair, a skeleton dipped in yellow wax with a silk scarf tied around her bald head. I hugged Chloe one last time before she disappeared forever. I told her she looked like a pirate and she laughed. Me, when I go to the beach, I always sit with my right foot tucked under me, Australia and New Zealand or I keep it buried in the sand. My fear is that people will see my foot and I'll start to die in their minds. The cancer I don't have is everywhere now. I don't tell Marla that. There are a lot of things we don't want to know about the people we love. We warm up to warm her up, to make her laugh. I tell Marla about the woman in Dear Abby who married a handsome, successful mortician, and on their wedding night, he made her soak in a tub of ice water until her skin was freezing to the touch. And then he made her lie in a bed completely still while he had intercourse with her cold, inert body. The funny thing is this woman had done this as a newlywed and gone on to do it for the next 10 years of marriage. And now she was writing to Dear Abby to ask if Dear Abby thought it meant something. Chapter 14. This is why I love the support group so much. If people thought you were dying, they gave you their full attention. If this might be the last time they saw you, they really saw you. Everything else about their checkbook balance and radio songs and messy hair went out the window. You had their full attention. People listened instead of just waiting for their turn to speak. And when they spoke, they weren't telling you a story. When the two of you talked, you were building something. And afterward, you were both different than before. Marla had started going to the support groups after she found the first lump. The morning after we found her second lump, Marla hopped into the kitchen with both legs in one leg in her pantyhose and said, Look, I'm a mermaid. Marla said, This isn't like when you guys sit backward on a toilet and pretend it's a motorcycle. This is a genuine accident. Just before Marla and I met at Remaining Men Together, there was the first lump. 
and now there was a second lump. What you have to know is that Marla is still alive. Marla's philosophy of life, she told me, is that she can die at any moment. What you have to know about Marla, her philosophy of life, she told me, is that she could die at any moment. The tragedy of her life is that she doesn't. When Marla found the first lump, she went to a clinic where slumped scarecrow mothers sat in plastic chairs on three sides of the waiting room with limp doll children bald in their laps or lying at their feet. The children were sunken and dark around their eyes, the way oranges or bananas go bad and collapse, and the mothers scratched at the mar mats of dandruff from scalp yeast infections out of control, the way the teeth in the clinic looked huge in everyone's thin face. You saw how teeth were just shards of bone that come through your skin to grind things up. This is where you end up if you don't have health insurance. Before anyone knew any better, a lot of gay guys had wanted children and now the children were sick and the mothers are dying and the fathers are dead and sitting in the hospital, vomit smell of piss and vinegar, while a nurse asked each mother how long she'd been sick and how much weight she'd lost, and if her child has any living parent or guardian, Marla decides no. If she was going to die, Marla didn't want to know anything about it. Marla walked around the corner from the clinic to city laundry, and stole all the jeans out of the dryers, then walked to the dealer who gave her 15 bucks a pair. Then Marla bought herself some really good pantyhose, the kind that don't run. Even the good kind that don't run, Marla says, they snag. Nothing is static. Everything is falling apart. Marla stared. Marla started going to the support groups since it was easier to be around other human butt wipe. Everyone has something wrong. And for a while, her heart just sort of flatlined. Marla started a job doing prepaid funeral plans for a mortuary where sometimes great fat men, but usually fat women, would come out of the mortuary showroom carrying a crematory urn. Marla started Marla started a job doing prepaid funeral plans for a mortuary where sometimes great fat men, but usually fat women, would come out of the mortuary showroom carrying a crematory urn the size of an egg cup, and Marla would sit there at her desk in the foyer with her dark hair tied down in her snag pantyhose and breast lump and doom and say, Madame, don't flatter yourself. We couldn't even get your burned up head into that tiny thing. Go back and get an urn the size of a bowling ball. Marla's heart looked the way my face was. The crap and the trash of the world post-consumer human butt wipe that no one would ever go to the trouble to recycle. Between the support groups and the clinic, Marla told me, she had met a lot of people who were dead. These people were dead and on the other side. And at night, they called on the telephone. 
Marla would go to bars and hear the bartender calling her name. And when she took the call, the line was dead. At the time, she thought this was hitting bottom. When you're 24, Marla says, you have no idea how far you can really fall. But I was a fast learner. For the first time, Marla filled a crematory urn. She didn't wear a face mask. And later, she blew her nose and there was tissue. And it was a black mess of Mr. Whoever. In the house on Paper Street, if the phone rang only once and you picked it up and the line was dead, you knew it was someone trying to reach Marla. This happened more than you might think. In the house on Paper Street, I don't know if the ambiance of um, a dog drinking water helps. This is what happens during lives. For anyone who's going to join me later, um, this is kind of what happens. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, we have, we'll be done after this chapter. It's like a couple of pages. Yeah, okay. So I'll start over. Um, okay. In the house on Paper Street, the police detective started calling about my condominium explosion. And Tyler stood with his chest against my shoulder, whispering into my ear while I held the phone to the other ear. And the detective asked if I knew anyone who would make homemade dynamite. Disaster is a natural part of my evolution, Tyler whispered, toward tra tragedy and disillusion. I told the detective that it was the refrigerator that blew up my condo. I'm breaking my attachment to physical power and possessions, Tyler whispered, because only through destroying myself can I discover the greater power of my spirit. The dynamite, the detective said, there were impurities, a residue of ammonium oxalate and potassium perch, perch, perchloride that might mean the bomb was homemade and the deadbolt on the front door was shuttered. I said I was in Washington, D.C. that night. The detective on the phone explained how someone had sprayed a canister of Freon into the deadbolt lock and then tapped the lock with a cold chisel to shatter the cylinder. This is the way criminals are stealing bikes. The liberty, the li liberty, the lib. Libitate, lib why can I say it? The libertator who destroys my property, Tyler says, is fighting to save my spirit. The teacher who clears all possessions from my path will set me free. The detective said whoever set the homemade dynamite could have churned the gas and blown out the pilot lights on the stove days before the explosion took place. The gas was just the trigger. It would take days for the gas to fill the condo before it reached the compressor at the base of the refrigerator and the compressor's electric motor set off the explosion. Tell him, Tyler whispered. Yes, you did it. You blew it all up. That's what he wants to hear. I tell the detective, no, I did not leave the gas on and then leave town. I loved my life. I loved that condo. I loved every stick of furniture. That was my whole life. Everything. The lamps, the chairs, the rugs were me. The dishes and the cabinets were me. The plants were me. The television was me. It was me that blew up. Couldn't he see that? The detective said, not to leave town. Okay, guys. 
Well, we're on chapter 15. Thank you guys so much for being here and enduring all of the needy dogs that own me. I hope you enjoyed the reading tonight. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, hit the like button if you liked it. And if you didn't, then hit the I didn't like it button. <laughs> we'll hopefully do this next week. Love to you all. Have a safe night. Good night.